We wanna welcome you to today's uh, presentation. Thank you so much for uh, attending. Uh, this is going to be just a spectacular event and we will all be uh, impacted uh, in many ways, uh, personally, business-wise, and uh, spiritually. So thank you for joining us. Uh, let us uh, open with, uh, with prayer. Lord, we acknowledge you. Uh, we thank you for your presence uh, this day. Uh, we confess our frailties to you. We thank you for uh, the saving grace through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And uh, we thank you for the opportunities, Lord, to serve you in this life, to serve each other. And uh, Lord, we pray now that we would all receive divine inspiration and uh, guidance uh, through this uh, presentation this day, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Uh, amen. Thank you. With that, uh, it's a delight to introduce uh, to you Teresa Anderson, uh, our executive uh, director, and uh, Mary Lynn Clement, uh, our marketing and events coordinator. We're so appreciative of these folks and all that they do uh, day in and day out to make these events uh, possible, uh, monthly events, quarterly events, and annual events. Um, we also wanna thank our uh, sponsor uh, this, uh, this, for this event, uh, Structure Tech, and as well, uh, the many, many dozens of sponsors that uh, sponsor us throughout the year and make these uh, events possible. Thank you so much for all that you do. Um, with that, what a uh, pleasure to uh, introduce uh, to you uh, today, uh, Fred uh, Sievert. Uh, Fred is uh, an author and retired uh, president of New York Life Insurance uh, Company. And uh, Fred started his career as a teacher, later uh, entered the insurance business and retired in 2007 as president of New York Life Insurance Company, a Fortune 100 uh, organization corporation. Following his retirement at the age of 59, uh, Fred attended Yale Divinity School and was awarded a master's, master's degree in religion uh, in two, 2011. Um, and with that began the next chapter, if you will, of uh, Fred's life. And so in his career, Fred uh, enjoyed many successes, but also had to deal with much stress, uh, many challenges, and even some serious setbacks. Through it all, uh, he credits his success to a reliance on daily prayer uh, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit uh, and his relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, which has been profound. So without further ado, what a pleasure to introduce to you uh, Fred Sievert with today's presentation entitled Fast Starting a Career of Consequences. Good morning. Thank you, Jeffrey, for that kind introduction. And I also want to extend thanks to Teresa and Mary Lynn for putting this whole presentation together. It really is an honor and a pleasure for me to present to this group. Uh, I apologize for being on being on a video and not in person, but I've looked through your archives and I'm looking forward to visiting and in person some of your future events. Um, the the title of this is uh, Fast Starting a Career of Consequence, which matches the title of my third book, and I think you'll see why as we go through it. But let me open in a word of prayer. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the many blessings in our lives and for the value and inspiration we derive from these sessions. Please guide and direct my words in ways that will speak to those in the viewing audience and enable them to come closer to you on their respective faith journeys. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Here's an outline of my presentation today. I'm gonna to talk about my retirement pursuits. I've been very busy in retirement, as you'll see. My wife often says I've miserably failed retirement, but I tell her, no, I'm happier than I've been ever. In fact, the Wealth Channel magazine asked me to write an article about imagining your future after retirement. And I entitled it Happier, Healthier, and Younger in Retirement. 
because that's exactly how I felt in 2013. And I, that's exactly the way I feel today. Um, and you, you, you can't help but feel that way when you're following God's calling for your life. I'm then going to cover very quickly just the genesis and themes of the three books I've written uh, since retirement. And also, I'll probably focus mostly on Roman numerals three, four, and five here to cover the uh, God's presence on this journey, this book journey, which is, is quite remarkable and miraculous. And, uh, the, and I will touch upon some of the biblical principles and business tips from the book. I really feel it, it's a relevant book to talk about, especially to this audience. And of course, I'll end with my faith journey. And I want to just start by saying that, you know, my passion throughout my working lifetime really has been to positively impact the lives of others, particularly young people, by speaking and writing about my faith and my business experience. And I, I really now recognize that as a true calling from God. And I often say to people that I view my long business career as a mere prologue to what I'm doing today. And this, this book has really been a blessing to write because it combines both my faith and my business experience. So here's sort of a summary of all the things I've been doing in retirement. Uh, family time, obviously, uh, I committed to that. It's very important to me that I spend the time with the family. Um, my spiritual development, I've felt throughout my career with the intensity of my workload that my spiritual education and development were deficient. So I had kind of had this lifelong dream of retiring early and going to divinity school, which which I actually did. Uh, interesting story is I, I retired at age 59, and I was leaving my home in Connecticut to go up to Yale. And my oldest daughter, Heidi, was visiting with us with her daughter, my granddaughter. And she yelled out from the living room as I was walking out the front door with my book bag. She yelled out, Dad, play nice with the other kids and don't forget to share. Now, that was funny at the time, but it really was quite profound because that whole experience was about spiritual sharing. I also had this dream for a long time of teaching in college. So in retirement, even while I was at Yale Divinity School, I was teaching a business school class on leadership and strategy at Fairfield University in Connecticut. And in retirement, I remained on five nonprofit boards and two for-profit boards while I was also mentoring several young executives, which I continue to do today. And I ended up writing three books. But first, I want to tell you about the family, given the commitment I mentioned to the family. Uh, my wife, Sue, and I have been married. We'll be celebrating our 53rd anniversary in about two weeks. Um, and we have five kids. Now, we were told when we were young and first married that we would never have children of our own. We went through years of fertility testing, even in vitro fertilization attempts and lots of prayers. And it wasn't until 16 years later, along came the miracle of Zachary. We had actually, in between that time, adopted three daughters, two Korean orphans and one special needs child, all adopted as infants. But 16 years later, along comes the miracle of Zachary, a natural born son. And a short 18 months later, along came the miracle of Corey, another natural born son. And a very short five weeks later, along came the miracle of a vasectomy. I said to myself, Lord, thank you, but five is enough. And it's interesting and ironic that we have five kids, three adopted and two natural born. Now we have five grandchildren, three adopted, also Korean orphans adopted by one of our own Korean adopted orphan children, three Korean orphans and grandchildren and two natural born grandchildren. And I want to tell you about a very special event that occurred this year in 2022 for the Sievert family. Sue and I had been planning what we would do longer term, and, and we, we, had, we decided on kind of what I call a back to the future move of the family to the extent possible. And that was a multi-generational move where we wanted to bring family members together under one roof. 
And we searched for a year and a half to find an appropriate place in a, in a tough job market and we or real estate market. And we just happened to find this spectacular place. I view it as very providential that we found this home in New Hampshire that's a former ski lodge that had been converted about 10 years prior to a residence. And unlike most ski lodges, it was uh, positioned at the top of the mountain, not the bottom of the mountain. So it has spectacular views in, in almost 180 degree direction. And already my daughter Dina and her family of five have moved in with us. Sue and I are in that house. And my daughter, my special needs daughter, Denise, is living with us. And I'm still working on other family members to join us. And it's it's really been quite a blessing. We moved in in August. And as I said, I don't have time to describe it now, but there were there were many, many interventions of God that went along with this particular move over the last five months. Here are some uh, cover images of the three books I've written. And, uh, you know, I just want to start by saying I'm not here to sell books. Uh, when I do sell books, I give all of the revenues to uh, Christian-based charities. Uh, and if you are interested after hearing the stories, uh, probably the best place, place to buy them is at my website, storiesofgodsgrace.com, which is at the bottom of the screen where I'm selling the books at a discount with no shipping costs. But again, I'm not I'm not here to sell books. But I want to tell you about the Genesis uh, and the themes of each of these books quickly. Um, God Revealed was in my first book. The subtitle is Revisit Your Past to Enrich Your Future. And it came about when I was having dinner with my daughter, Dina, her husband, Doug, and I was telling them all these stories about marvelous experiences throughout the course of my life. Not all of them faith-based, but most of them faith-based. And Dina, at the end of the dinner, said, Dad, you know, you really need to memorialize these stories for the benefit of the family. And so I decided I was still in divinity school, and I decided to start writing it. And in fact, I did uh, ultimately publish it in 2013. Um, and the theme really was about my own encounters with God. It, it really is an expanded version of my testimony. But the subtitle, Revisit to your, your Past to Enrich Your Future, was done to encourage the reader to think about their own past. Think about times when God may have been intervening in their lives, and they may not have actually realized it. And if you were to look at the 75 or more uh, reviews, or I think it's more than 100 now, reviews on Amazon for this book, many of them say that was the value of the book, the introspection it caused for them in thinking about their own past. The second book is on the right there, Grace Revealed, and the subtitle is Finding God's Strength in Any Crisis. That book came about as a result of the promotional tour I had taken on the first book, and I had done a lot of TV and radio interviews. I did a, many, many uh, in-person presentations. That was before the pandemic, and I, I uh, spoke to uh, a great number of small groups, Bible studies, uh, book clubs, breakfast clubs, uh, Sunday school classes, small groups. And in those groups, because I was telling examples of stories from my first book, it kind of gave them permission to tell me their stories. And I heard these absolutely compelling stories of people who were in severe crises of one form or another and only recovered from it due to their faith and their relationship with Christ. And I just want to mention some of the chapters in that book, because I'd be willing to bet that everyone watching this webinar, either themselves or a member of their family or extended families, have had these kinds of crises. There's a chapter on sexual or emotional abuse. There's a chapter on uh, addictions. There's one on loss of loss of loved ones. There's one on PTSD. There's one on serious illnesses. And like I say, all of these people survive, survived this. Many of them were suicidal because of the strength of their faith. 
The bottom book here is the most recent one, Fast Starting a Career Consequence. The subtitle is Practical Christ-Centered Advice for Entering or Re-Entering the, work, re the Workforce. And I'm going to talk more about that in the subsequent slides. So I, I chose this book for a couple of reasons. One is I thought it'd be relevant to this audience, but more importantly, it's an example of the many, many times uh, I experienced God, God's presence throughout my lifetime. The providential events that could not, in my mind, have been coincidental. And that happened. I thought this book was a great example of that. So I'm going to talk about some of those providential interventions in the, this particular book project. But let me mention the genesis of this one. It was my daughter, Dina who had recently graduated from college, and she was in an entry-level position in a very big company. She was down in the marketing department uh, fulfilling marketing orders. And she came to me after a couple of months and said, Dad, you got to give me some tips on how to succeed here and how to build a real career out of this. And so I thought long and hard about that. I prayed about that. I thought, and I was still working at New York Life, so I thought about how I might recognize someone deeper down in the organization as a person of high potential. And I gave her five tips to follow. And she did that extraordinarily well and actually ended up with several promotions over the subsequent couple of years. Um, I also wrote an article about those five tips, and I used those tips in three college commencement addresses that I did. Um, and marketwatch.com, I don't know how many people are familiar with that, but marketwatch.com is a big blog that's sponsored by the Wall Street Journal. And they claim to have 20 million viewers every month. Um, so it's a big, it's a big blog. And they got a hold of me. They saw the article and they got a hold of me and they said they loved all these five tips, but they really wanted me to expand on tip number five. And I'm going to talk about that later in the presentation. Um, so I did that and submitted it. It got published in 2019. And um, my literary agent, who had seen the article I had written and also had saw had seen the uh, the Market Watch blog, gave me a call and he said, "Fred, you know this is really good." And he said, "I don't see anything else like this out there. It's very topical. You have another book here." And I said to him, you know, I hadn't thought about that, but, um, you know, I, I will. And if I do write another book, you know, I'm going to talk about my faith. And he said, of course, it's, it's in your DNA. So let me talk about the God's presence on this book journey, because it really, it really is very providential. Um, I'll start with the publisher. And the publisher had a team of people that supported me. We had several conference calls over a period of months. And, you know, we talked about book, the book cover design and the size of the book and the price of the book and the release date. Well, at the end of 2020, we were talking about the release date. I, I had submitted the manuscript, but it wasn't in print yet. And the team and the leader of the team said to me, your release date's going to be April 3rd of 21. And I thought to myself, wow, that's pretty far off. You know, and I, I said to the team, I, I said, you know, I really would like to get it sooner than that. If maybe you could get it printed earlier. And the CEO of the, the, the publisher was on this call. He, he became pretty good friends of mine, a friend of mine. And, um, the uh, the leader of the team said, well, I think we can get it to you in June. And I said, but, you know, this is designed for college students, Christian college students who will be graduating in May. Isn't there any way we can get it quicker? And the CEO jumped in and he said, Fred, we're going to get you cop printed copies in March. Now, to me, that that was providential, but it was even more surprising. Be, be, for the reason I call it a concession on the part of the publisher. And, and the reason is my contract with the publisher, if I bought printed copies of the book at the printing cost and sold them before the book release date, they got no royalties. 
So, you know, God was certainly in this, that I was able to get them. He promised it in March, and I got copies in March. <laughs> Next on this journey, another unexpected event. New York Life is a secular organization. Um, you know, I talked about my faith a lot, but every imaginable faith was represented at New York Life. And after writing this book, I got a call from a, a friend of mine who was the managing partner of a very large sales office in Dallas, and second largest office at New York Life. And he, he called me and he said, Fred, I see this book is out. I haven't read it yet. But he said, I, I have a study group of 15 other managing partners who are running big offices around the country. And I would like to have you speak to that, those, those, uh, my next study group meeting. And, you know, I thought to myself, yeah, that, I'd love to do that. But, you know, this, this is a secular organization. Well, he said, you know, you can talk about your experiences at New York Life, too, but I want you to cover your book. So as a result of that call and that, this, that presentation to that study group, since then, I have now spoken to 14 of those offices at New York Life in Zoom calls. This is during the pandemic. And I talked about the book. And, you know, they had approval from internal uh, compliance and legal and even the CEO to do this. And I just thought this was remarkable from a company that's secular. But then even more surprising to me, one of the boards I've been on is the CNO board. It's a holding company that holds three operating insurance companies. And um, as a director of the company, I speak regularly with the CEO. And he had a call with me after this New York Life event, or as, as I was in the middle of this New York Life, uh, these New York Life presentations, and he said to me during the call, we talked about business, but then he said to me, well, how's the book going? And I, I told him about New York Life. And he said to me, Fred, I want you to speak to our agents. And CNO set up a Zoom call with 6,000 agents. Again, secular company. And I'm speaking to 6,000 agents about my faith. And also, I spoke about being on the board at CNO, which they found interesting as well. But again, God was in this. Then marketwatch.com strikes again. They, they came back to me after they saw this book was published. And they said to me, Fred, you know, a lot of people coming out of COVID are reimagining their future. Can you write an article for our blog about the considerations one must take in reimagining your future. And I said, certainly, I'll do that. But the thing that surprised me and kind of bothered me was he then said, but uh, please keep it entirely secular. Don't mention your faith and don't mention the divinity school experience. And I almost said, well, you know, then I'll decline from doing it. And I didn't say that. I think it was the Holy Spirit guiding me. I did not say that because I thought, you know, my passion is to influence people's lives. And I can influence a lot of lives with this article. So I wrote it the way they wanted me to write it. And I remember they published it on September 23rd of 1920, uh, of 2021. And um, then uh, about three or four days later, I get a call from them, and this was the big surprise. I get a call from them, and they told me, you know, we ran your article. You saw it. It was very well received. And he said, but we have a request of you. And I said, okay, what's that? We want you to revise the article. And we want you to forget what we said about making it entirely secular. And you can talk about your faith and your decision to go to divinity school. And I thought I almost fell off my chair when they said this. This had to be God's providence. So I sent I sent them a new version very quickly. And within one week of the first publication on September 23rd, almost to the minute, they published it on September 30th in the new version. Again, this has been such a rewarding experience. But but again, I'll just say. This is one example of throughout my career, 
having hundreds, at least dozens of such interventions by God. And finally, the market for this book. Initially, when you publish a book, and maybe some people on this on this call have published books, you'll know that the publisher always says, keep a pretty tight target market when you do your proposal. So my target market was Christian college students who were going to be recently or soon entering the workforce. And originally, the, the subtitle was going to be Practical Christ-Centered Advice for Entering the Workforce. But then I started thinking before it ever went to print, I started thinking, well, you know, there's veterans coming back from military service. There's adults coming off child rearing years. So I, I added the word re-enter. So now the book said entering, the subtitle said entering or re-entering the workforce. So the market expanded there. But then imagine the millions of people reimagining their careers or getting back to work after COVID-19 furlough. So the, this market just expanded dramatically and it wasn't my doing. This was God's providence that that enabled me to suddenly have a much broader market that would be interested in this book. But probably the more astounding thing to me, and you can check this, there's there's about, I think, 75 uh, reviews on Amazon with this book. And, you know, Christ's name is in the subtitle. And about half or more of the reviews, the people say this book is not just for Christians because of the value of the business advice. And that's one of the reasons I say that I think this book in particular was one relevant for this discussion. So let me get into the fourth section of my presentation and talk about some of the content of the book. There, there are 10 chap, there are five chapters on biblical principles in the workplace. And then there are 10 chapters on fast starting career tips. I expanded beyond the five that, that I told my daughter, Dina. Uh, but the interesting thing that's important to realize is each one of the, every one of these chapters has multiple scriptural reverence, references and multiple uh, examples of business experiences, even in the biblical principles section that I experienced myself during my working lifetime. And I'm just going to talk about a couple of the chapters. Chapter one, I firmly believe that we all have God-given spiritual gifts. Uh, absolutely believe that. And I think it was it's very important. That's why I made this chapter one for people to identify and utilize their spiritual gifts, not just in their church work, but in their secular work or their business work. And I had just, uh, again, not coincidentally, uh, several months before I submitted the book for printing, I had gone through a seminar at my church that in which we all went through an assessment tool to, de to determine our spiritual gifts. And, you know, it was one of these things. It was a booklet that had about 70 questions, and you answered the questions, and then you scored yourself and, and summarized it all. And it, it really bubbled up the top three or four likely spiritual gifts that you possess. And I thought I found it very accurate. I think it did identify my spiritual gifts. But as I was going to publish the book, I thought, you know, I wish I could put that test in the in the book, in the appendix. But I couldn't find a copy of it. I didn't know who the author was. I had a I have a friend named Darren Shearer who uh, founded the Theology of, of, of Business Institute. Um, and in, I think it's in Dallas. And I called him because I wanted to see if he could help me find the author. And I explained this whole situation to him. And I explained that I had gone through this assessment and I wanted to get permission from the author to put it in Appendix A of the book. And he paused for a second and he said to me, Fred, you have my permission. And I thought, what? He said, I'm the author of that booklet. Now tell me that's not providential. That was not a coincidence. And, you know, my, my I'll just mention that my gifts, which this, this test was very accurate, 
my strong faith, my leadership skills, and my financial acumen. And everywhere, in every chapter throughout this book, I talk about the application of my gifts at work with specific examples. Every chapter also, you see at the bottom of scripture reference, Romans 12, 4 to 8, every chapter has multiple scripture references, but I always put one at the top that I think is pretty critical. And this one I put at the top of chapter one because it was Paul talking about spiritual gifts and uh, you know the members of the body of Christ and how we can serve him by utilizing our spiritual gifts. The other principles, biblical principles in the workplace are these four chapters. I'm not going to talk about them, but I highlighted chapter three because it got a lot of attention. It was, uh, the title is Jesus as a workplace partner, because that's exactly how I felt about Jesus in my career, throughout my career. Um, and I, I quoted here, uh, Matthew uh, 11, verses 28 through 30. That was the important scriptural references, and that's the one where Christ himself said, you know, come to me, you who are weary and overburdened. Um, my my yoke is, my burden is light, my yoke is easy, uh, and I will give you rest. I'm paraphrasing, but you know the, you know the scripture reference. And I always felt, you know, uh, uh, loved that imagery of being yoked to Jesus. I felt like every day at work, I was yoked to Jesus, and I was relying every day at work of the, uh, the, for the guidance of the Holy Spirit to, to give me advice and help me make difficult decisions. Getting into uh, the 10 fast start tips. Um, here's what I, here's one of the tips that was in the original group that I gave to Dina. And I said to her, you know, I want you to understand and embrace the company's mission statement. In fact, I'd like you to commit the statement to memory so that you can recite it. And Dina said to me, Dad, you really want me walking around reciting the company's mission statement? And I said, no. I said, I, I don't want you doing that because you'll appear arrogant, but I want you to memorize it so that it's embedded in your brain. And if it's embedded in your brain, you can instantly recall it and that will allow you to, to assess the decisions that are being made by your superiors and peers against the mission. And in fact, it will allow you to help make those type decisions when you're in a position of leadership at the company. And I said, you know, I say that because it's critically important for companies to remain true to their mission and to be mission driven. The other chapter I want to mention from uh, this section of the book is chapter 10. Now, I'll start by saying this was number five that Market Watch said we want you to expand upon. They like them all, but they like number five the most. And I see this as perhaps the most important of all the fast starting tips. And for many people, many young people, it's also the most difficult. And for Dina, especially because she never took a math class, she never took an accounting or economics class in college. But I wanted her to understand the financial underpinnings of the business. So I said to her, find somebody in the accounting department, develop a high level understanding of the balance sheet and income statement. And I, and you know, she nearly panicked, but I said, look, Dina, just remember, I just want you to get a, get a high level understanding. Yeah, you don't need to know all the accounting behind this. You don't need to know where every number comes from. I just want you to know how the income statement flows and how the balance sheet flows and how the income statement flows into the balance sheet every quarter. Um, so ask those questions and find someone who's going to help you out to get the understanding and ask a lot of questions. Then she knew how to do a spreadsheet. So I want you to do a spreadsheet, simple spreadsheet, six key numbers in a one column. And it's going to be the six, three numbers from the balance sheet, three numbers from the income statement every quarter. I want you to update this sheet every quarter. So get a hold of your company's financial statements. The three balance sheet numbers are the assets, the liabilities, and the net worth of the net equity of the company. The three income statement numbers are the total revenues, the total expenses, and the net income or, or the profit of the company. That's it, six numbers. 
Once you get your hands on the statement every quarter, it'll take you less than a minute and a half to put these six numbers in the spreadsheet. But then I want you to watch them and track those numbers. Watch them closely. See what the patterns are emerging. Go back and talk to the accountant about patterns you see emerging. Maybe the revenues are going really fast, or maybe they're declining. Same thing with the expenses. And maybe the income's bouncing around in volatile quarter to quarter, and you're wondering what's happening that drives that. And ask the questions about that. And I said to her, you know, at New York Life, uh, I was still at New York Life when I was giving her this advice. I said, I got eight or 10 people reporting directly to me. We're at a very high level in the company. And if I at a staff meeting said, uh, somebody tell me what the revenues were last quarter, nobody would have a clue. They wouldn't even take a guess. And here you are deep in the organization watching these numbers quarter to quarter. You're going to have a pretty good feel for where they're at. Then I said, when you're really comfortable with all this, I want you to go back to the accounting guy and I want you to ask what I'm calling the killer question. And marketwatch.com referenced the killer question in the title of this article for the blog. And I said, ask it in exactly the way I'm going to say it to you. You, you say to this guy from accounting or lady from accounting, what drives the profitability of this business? And I said, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a long pause. And the answer is, I'm going to have to get back to you on that. And I said, I also wouldn't be surprised if the CEO of the company, big company, finds out that some young lady down in the deep in the marketing department is asking questions like this. That's a way to get identified as a high potential person. And she did that. And by the way, the CEO did find out. Here's the other chapters from uh, the, you know, the fast start tips section of the book. I've highlighted uh, some of these. Um, because they were all the chapters are important. I prayed over all these chapters. I worked hard on each one. Chapter nine, I think, is the second most important rel relative to uh, only only exceeded by the financial step. Because so many people in an organization, even at a high level, don't understand the difference between strategy and tactics. So I put a lot of time into teaching how to develop strategic thinking capability. Uh, and as I said, I think this may be one of the best chapters in the book. I also heard over the years, a lot of people saying, you know, my company's pressed to get more and more profits and cut expenses, and nobody's really investing money in developing me. So I wrote chapter 11, take charge of your own development. And this chapter is loaded with specific ideas, how an individual can take take charge of their own development. Make every presentation a command performance. Uh, <laughs> this, um, I'll just tell you a funny story. I was at my son's wedding in January and a friend of uh, the bride, a young man came up to me. He said, you're Mr. Sievert, right? And I said, yeah. He said, I read your book. And he said, I absolutely love chapter 13. He said, I'm asked to present all the time and you laid out a template and a process to go through to do spectacular presentations. Thank you so much. And you know, I, I had actually been thinking about pulling that chapter out of the book because I thought, you know, who's going to read through all this and implement it? And finally, chapter 15, which is balancing faith, family, and career. We all struggle with that. This was, you know, the last chapter of the book, and I felt it was inspired, uh, and, and it really talked about my coping techniques running New York Life, a company with 65,000 employees and agents, and finding a way to appropriately balance faith, family, and career. And I list those, those tips and those coping techniques in chapter 15. So I want to tell you briefly now about my faith journey and my testimony. It's told much more thoroughly in chapter one of, or in, in the entire book, God Revealed. Uh, but in chapter one, four of these stories that I'm going to tell you here are uh, really experiences in which I palpably felt God's presence. 
And I put in the ages at which these occurred. My church asked me to do an elevator speech, so I kind of related this to floors in a skyscraper, you know, 12, floor 12s, 37, 50, 55, and 74. But I want to start by saying I was not raised in a worshiping family. I rarely went to church. But I was a baby boomer, a lot of kids in the neighborhood, a lot of faiths represented. I had lots of conversations walking around the block. And I had a lot of questions. And one summer day, I was laying uh, on my bed at home alone. Nobody else was home. My parents were working. My brother was out playing. And I started contemplating all these questions, which at the time I didn't think were theological questions, but proved to be pretty deep theological questions. Like, how did, how did something come from nothing? How did this universe exist? How did you know, what's this harmony in the universe, in the in the solar system, and in the galaxies, and why, you know, who is God? Is God always with me? Who's this guy, Jesus? What about the Trinity and the Holy Spirit? Um, are you going to be with me always? Uh, can I can I rely on you? And I actually had an out-of-body experience at age 12. I felt I was lifted up from the bed and in the hands of God. I did not hear God's voice. I did not see a vision, but I really felt I was in his hands and looking down at my myself on the bed. I think my soul was being touched by God. And the communication I got, again, wasn't verbal, but the communication I got was, yes, I'm real. Yes, I will be with you always. And yes, question answers will come to your questions over time. The reinforcing miracle at age 37, I don't need to elaborate on. That was the birth of my son, Zachary. A lot of things happen in between there that are in the book, but that was a, a pivotal moment. Um, saving a family from ruin at age 50 was, an, was a big convention I attended where there were 7,000 agents representing 200 companies in Chicago. I was an invited guest. And as I was in that auditorium of 7,000 attendees, they they talked about the winner of a contest they had every year. Uh, it was called Real Life Stories Competition, and the winner, you know, would be someone who talked about the value of insurance. And it was a young widow, probably in her late 30s, whose husband had applied for insurance on a Friday, and uh, was killed in an automobile accident two days later on Sunday. And they interviewed the wife, the, the widow, and she talked about the value of the insurance covering covering the mortgage on her house and the education of the kids. And she, they actually went outside and interviewed his two very young children. And it was very emotional. Uh, no, There wasn't a dry eye in the house, but the tears were running down my cheek for a different reason. And that is because I had experienced this very case come across my desk three or four months before. And I wasn't sure it was a New York Life case until at the end they interviewed the New York Life agent. I nearly fell to my knees. Uh, I was very emotionally moved by this because it came at a time when I was struggling about, you know, I was age 50. I was struggling about, you know, the value of what I did for a living. And this came across my desk with a folder from the law department in which they were recommending I deny the claim. It's the only time in my life, my whole career, anybody asked me to act on a death claim. And they wanted me to deny the claim because there was no premium with the application on Friday, and hence there was no legal insurance in force on Sunday. But there was an extenuating circumstance, and that was that the there was a check on the desk of the deceased, signed by the dece deceased, made out to New York Life for the full premium amount. So I looked at it, didn't know about the kids, the mortgage, didn't know anything. And I and I said, what's the right thing to do? I know we're going to lose money if I approve this, but the right thing to do is to approve it. So I marked it approved, never to see it again, except play before my very eyes in front of 7,000 people. I mean, this was an incredibly moving moment for me. And I went back to the office to study about death claims because, you know, I hadn't really paid much attention to it. And I realized that this was not a once in a month, once in a week, once in a day, once in an hour event. New York Life was paying over 300 death claims per day. This was the business we were in, and I wasn't even really focused on it. So I told that story, and I, I viewed all of this as a message from God. I told the story to thousands of New York Life agents and employees, and I think they understood 
that this, in fact, what this this was a testimony of sorts on my part because I told it the same way I just told it to you. The epiphany in India also was a business related story. We had a joint venture company that we owned twenty six percent of, and our partner in India owned seventy four percent. They and they owned hospitals and clinics also, and. Um, I went to every board quarterly board meeting for several years. And on one of those meetings, the chairman said to me, Fred, how would you like to go visit a new cardiac facility we just completed? And I said, okay, fine, let's go. So we went and it was a spectacular uh, new modern building. We walked into the atrium. When we walked in, he said to me, Fred, as long as you're here, would you like to observe a procedure? And I, I I thought twice about that. I thought, well, I'll probably be in an amphitheater, you know, 12 or 15 feet above the operating table. If I get a little queasy, I could turn aside. So I said, yeah, okay. Well, he introduces me to the chief of staff who takes me in the scrub room and, and I have to scrub down. They put all the paraphernalia on me, the hat and the mask and the gown and the booties and the gloves. March, he marches me into operating room four and positions me right at the head of the operating table. The patient's head is two, two inches from my stomach. And I am standing there watching a quadruple bypass surgery. There's an open chest cavity right in front of me, 18 inches from my nose, and a beating heart. This, to me, was a profound spiritual experience, very profound experience. I was crying profusely, and I was worried my tears were going to fall into the, the face of the patient, but I thank God I had the mask on. The only time I thank God to have the mask on. But anyway, this was so profound. All I could think about was the marvelous creation of God, the human creation, but more about his other creations and how this heart, even a, a damaged heart, could beat continuously for 70, 80, 90 years and not miss a beat. And it regulates depending on what you're doing. If you know it's different if you're exercising or shoveling snow or whatever you're doing. I mean, this to me was such great evidence of the existence of. God and his marvelous creation. I couldn't imagine how any doctor who ever watched this could not feel the same way. And that's, that story and the, the one before at the Saving a Family for Merlin really encouraged me to go to divinity school. And the last one I'll talk about happened this year in 2022. My wife and I took a vacation to Florida. In Florida, she had a massive heart attack. We rushed her to the hospital. She probably should have died on the way. She was losing the feeling in her arms and legs. We got to the hospital. They took her right into surgery and did a stent. And it worked. It helped. But in the testing and speaking to the cardiologist on the way out, uh, he said, um, you know, her heart pumping capacity is down to 35%. Um, that's low. Uh, we don't know if any of it will ever come back. This was a massive heart attack. Most people die from it. He said a normal person of her age would be in the 55 to 65% range. Anyway, we left. We went back to Massachusetts where we lived at the time. We got a new cardiologist, went to him the first time. He, he said all the same things as he reviewed the records from the hospital in Florida. And then he, then he said, I'm going to put you through all these tests again. I want you to come back in a couple of weeks. So we did. We came back. We sat down in his office. He pulled up the results on the screen, and he looked puzzled. He was going very slowly through the screen. He's punching his keys, and Sue and I are looking at each other like, uh-oh, what's going on here? And he turned around, and he said, this is remarkable. Your heart pumping capacity is now at 67%. This is one month after this massive heart attack where we were told it may never come back to normal. And at 67%, it was above normal. Now tell me that isn't an act of God. And I wanna finish my remarks with, with some closing comments. Um, 
I, uh, without the the Lord and the guidance of the Lord throughout my career, especially my working working life, uh, my life could have been very, very different. Some of the kids I hung around with, even before I was 12, later got themselves into a lot of trouble, you know, stealing cars, burglarizing homes, and doing doing a lot of bad stuff. But, you know, God put me on the right path at age 12. But I say to you, this doesn't have to happen early in your life. You know, I did. I wasn't raised in a worshiping family. It doesn't have to happen early in your life. Uh, it can occur anytime. And whatever your age, you can come to Christ. Right now, you can come to Christ. You don't have to wait. And the best example in the Bible, and I did deep dives of the Bible, Old and New Testament at Divinity School. The best example I think I found was the thief being crucified on a cross next to Christ, who acknowledged Jesus as the Messiah and asked for his mercy and pardon. And Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. So I encourage you to ask him into your life. And you too could be yoked to Jesus in your business career and in your regular life. And you'll have the most powerful business partner imaginable. So thank you for listening. And I wish you all a very Merry Christmas. Thank you, Fred, for that inspiring presentation. And uh, again, just the examples of seeing and sharing faith uh, in the workplace throughout uh, your career, all the experiences you've had. Uh, we're so grateful. Um, and with that, there may be those here today that uh, can relate. And um, this may be the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. Uh, perhaps you're here and you realize that you've never made the Christian uh, commitment that uh, Fred uh, has referred to uh, in his presentation. And so we want to uh, today uh, help you find peace with God. And uh, we need to recognize our need to begin with. Romans 3.23 says, uh, all of us are sinners and we must admit our need for a savior to begin with, how true that is. Um, secondly, to repent uh, of our sins, our sins do create a wall that separates us from God. And by confessing our sins and turning from them, uh, we will find forgiveness. Uh, the Bible does promise us in 1 John 1, 9, uh, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And finally, believe in Jesus. Uh, God wrought a miracle when he sent his only son to die, that he would pay for all of our sins. And we want to encourage you to put your faith in, in Christ today. The Bible says in John 3, 16, that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And as we reflect today, let us receive his salvation. Uh, Jesus is the sacrificial lamb, and through Jesus we have atonement, uh, bridging the gap between us as mortal man and almighty God in heaven. We have redemption, as if we've never sinned, and through Jesus, we can experience daily uh, forgiveness. And so in John 1.12, uh, the Bible says, uh, but as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God. And having uh, done so, we want to encourage you to confess your faith uh, with others. Uh, in Romans 10.9, uh, the Bible says that uh, you have been born again and are now part of God's family. And tell someone else what Jesus has done in your life. Uh, it's a guarantee. We guarantee that uh, we're all going to die at some point uh, in time. We're going to spend eternity somewhere, uh, either uh, in heaven or in hell. And we just uh, want you to 
take these uh, tracks with you. We want to give an invitation here today and invite you to uh, pray with us. Let, let's do so. Thank you. Lord, uh, I recognize my need for you as my Savior. I confess my sins to you now, and I turn from them, and I ask for your forgiveness, Lord. I believe in you, Lord Jesus, that you died for me, that I might have eternal life with you in heaven. Lord Jesus, I receive you now in my heart, and I thank you for forgiving me. I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you receive me into your kingdom. And I believe in my heart that you are my Lord and that God raised you from the dead, that I might be saved and spend eternity with you. I thank you, Lord, that I am now part of God's family and I commit my life to you from this day forward. Amen. And we just want to thank you for uh, praying that prayer with us. And uh, if you've uh, prayed that, uh, for the first time, uh, if you could acknowledge that, we'd be so grateful. And uh, perhaps many of you are, as I experienced in my life, uh, committed my heart to the Lord very early on, uh, young in life, and then uh, kind of went on a fast track and um, you know left God behind and uh, made a recommitment to the Lord. And perhaps that's you. Perhaps uh, today. Uh, you've made that recommitment to the Lord, and if you could let us know, uh, we want to welcome you back home, and uh, certainly uh, we, we uh, desire to follow up with you and come alongside <laughs> and congratulate you. Thank you so much, Fred, and at this time, uh, let's see if there are any questions. Uh, please feel free to use the chat box. Thank you. So Fred, we have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, you mentioned the importance of spiritual sharing. Can you share with us an example of where you felt the Holy Spirit was placing that opportunity before you? Yeah, there, there are a lot of examples in my books uh, of this very thing. And, you know, when I was younger, I didn't, <laughs> I often didn't, didn't do a lot of spiritual sharing, but since I wrote the books, uh, it's, it's really been a hallmark of my post-retirement years. But I think one of the best examples is I did a book signing in a church in Michigan, and um, they were I, I donated fifty books to them, and they were going to charge people ten dollars for the book, and then I'd sign the book. And I was headed to church that morning, and um, I looked, looked at my wallet, and all I had were twenty dollar bills. And I thought, wow, I'm going to need ten dollar bills to give people in change. And so I, I stopped at a bank machine where they allowed you to pick the denomination of your withdrawal, and they were all out of fives and tens. So, so I still didn't have 20s. So I, I was driving on the way to work, and I go by this store that, that was kind of like a Walmart's big department, uh, big store. It's called Myers in Michigan. And um, I stopped in there, and I went up to the, uh, the service counter. And I explained the situation. I said, I'm going to be signing a book I've written at church, and I have nothing but 20s. Can you give me about 20 $10 bills for, for, in change for $20 bills? And the woman said, yeah, yeah, certainly I could do that. This was a woman maybe in her late 30s. And um, she said, well, tell me about the book you wrote. So I started telling her about it. One thing I, I often tell people about is the predominance, the incredible prevalence of sexual abuse of women in particular as children. And I was telling her about that in that chapter of the book. And she started to cry. And she said, you know, I need to read that book. And so I went back out to my car and signed over a book to her. But to me, that was the Holy Spirit presenting that opportunity, maybe to the extent of even emptying out that, that that ATM machine for fives and tens. But, you know, there's just been so many examples of things like that. It's it's really remarkable and a real blessing to be able to share those experiences. Thank you, Fred. That's all the questions that we have time for this morning. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us.
Thank you. Pleasure to be with you. At this time, we'd ask you to uh, please complete the survey um, as you leave the webinar today. And also, if you could please indicate if you've made that decision uh, to accept uh, Jesus Christ uh, in your heart today for the first time and or a recommitment. And again, um, uh, if you could indicate that, please, uh, in the survey, uh, we welcome the opportunity to come alongside and, and get back to you on that. Thank you so much. We, uh, we want to also um, acknowledge the monthly roundtables uh, that take place. Um, and uh, again, they are listed. Uh, we encourage you to attend in person uh, in Kalamazoo, Grand Rapids, Holland, Birmingham, Plymouth, Rochester, uh, Oxford, and Naples, uh, Florida um, as well. And the virtual meetings are also available. Um, so we look forward to having you attend those. Uh, the next upcoming event is uh, Friday, January the 20th in um, Detroit, uh, our leadership uh, breakfast. And you can see uh, our website for the tickets and information uh, for that uh, event. We uh, want to as well, uh, thank you so much for the uh, donations. They are always welcome. Uh, you have the text to give. Uh, and recognize that CBRT is a 501c3 uh, nonprofit uh, organization supported 100% by your commitment, donations, investments. And you know, when it comes to uh, the investments uh, here, um, they are second to none. They have eternal impact and the ROI is beyond comprehension. And we just uh, thank you uh, for all of that uh, support. And again, a final thanks to all of our uh, sponsors. And as, as we close today, um, the author is uh, anonymous. The title is Believe. You can only do what you think you can. You will never accomplish more. If you find that you're afraid of yourself, there is little for you in store. For fear comes from the inside first. It's there if you only knew it. And you can win though you face the worst if you believe you are going to do it. Thank you so much for attending this event.